live. Okay. And this is being broadcast throughout the world. Right? Yeah, uh, sort of. It's a. Uh, and yeah, I'm not doing it live. I could do it live, but yeah. I'm not doing it yet live. Thank you. I'm just recording yeah. it. I'll, later, I'll do it. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the our second qu- session of uh, Midrash and Rashi, where we're looking at uh, Rashi's commentary from the beginning, but not not at every uh, but not at every pasuk. Only the only the things that really stand out in the way that Rashi uh, used Midrashim. And what we did last week was mainly an introduction of trying to understand how. Rashi uses Midrash when he uses Midrash, which is quite often, but when he uses Midrash, what, what are his choices? What, why does he use this particular one on that particular verse? So watched last week, the last pasuk that we touched on, which is only the second one that we dealt with, is chapter 1, verse 5. V'ruach Elohim erahefet al pene amayim. The Spirit of God was hovering Oh, no, sorry, it's verse, no. th- uh, verse 3. Yeah, uh, verse, two. verse 2. Sorry, 1-2. Yeah, I'm looking at the paragraph in, in Safari, so it threw me off. So it's Rashi on Genesis 1-2. Uh, in the Pasuk, read, the spirit of Elohim hovers above the water. And uh, that, that, that verse created a lot of problems for commentators. Um, Rashi... Rashi brings this following midrash. It's a combination of midrashim. Kisei akavod oved omed ba'avir umrahef al pene amayim beruach pif shel akadosh baruchu uvemaamaro kiyona merahefet alaken akubatir belaz akoveter in old French. So the spirit of God, Rashi says, it was the throne of divine glory that was standing in space, hovering over the face of the abyss or the waters by the breath of the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, and by his command, as the dove hovers over its nest. So this is not a the pshat of the pasuk. The Torah says, Ruach Elohim erahefet al the Spirit of God. Where do we bring the, the throne, the divine throne from? Is it a, a physical thing, an abstract thing? Um, what, what made Rashi write this commentary? So b- before I go to his commentary, I just, I'll tell you what I think is the perush here because it is a problematic pasuk. And that has to do with uh, a completely different issue that uh, is part of the, at least the early chapters of Bereshit, and that is the, um, the dialogue that we have between the book of Bereshit and the stories of creation up until the flood and the mythology of the ancient Near East. That was something that they, the, uh, the author of the Torah, the divine of the, of the Torah, could not have ignored because people were so well aware of all these myths. So you have to address them some, somehow. So it is presented as a polemic. It's, it's, it's there to reject those myths, but it's done in a very subtle way. So those are, they are mentioned, but they're being tweaked or twisted or, or changed in order to show that we have a different theology. So in this case, the Tehom, <clears throat> that the home is a direct reference to the uh, the deity or the goddess of the of the abyss in the ancient Babylonian or Near Eastern mythology. The, uh, her name there is Tiamat. The, sounds like the home, Tiamat. Tiamat is killed after a very violent battle. She is killed by the chief god, Murdoch or one of the other uh, deities. So there's a battle, and this battle is mentioned in, in Isaiah and other prophets. You know, it's, it is referred to in, in, uh, in one way or another. But here the Torah chose to, to show it from a completely different perspective. It is like telling the readers, you know, of, of that myth that the abyss has this uh, tremendous power. It's a deity. It's an independent entity. And one of the guys has to fight with her and kill it. Instead, what do you find here? The Spirit of God hovers over the water. It shows complete control. It's a meditation, right? The breath of God, meaning that God controls the whole world with, the, with His breath, just with His word, and not with any violent action. So it's a, it's a completely different picture than that which the, uh, the myths paint. Now, why did, why did Rashi have to bring this idea of Kisei Kavod? This is something that uh, Professor Twito 
Elazar Twitter in his uh, the book that I mentioned last week uh, mentions. He says, "Yesh bo maala she'en baherim." He says this midrash is not necessarily better than the other midrashim. All the midrashim that the rabbis uh, suggested are very creative. Why this specifically? He says, That was done to uh, reject the possibility of identifying Ruach Elohim with the Holy Spirit. Because yeah. Rashi is dealing already with Christian uh, Bible commentators. They look at the Pasuk and here you have Ruach Elohim. So uh, Rashi says, no, this is not Ruach Elohim. It's Kisei Kavod, And he goes in length to explain that. And... <clears throat> There's something that we uh, we have to keep in mind because the the, the polemic the uh, dispute with the, with Christianity will will come uh, up again and again. Um, same thing with uh, verse one five. The the Torah says, vayi boker yom ehad, yom ehad day one, not first day, day one. If you follow the, the grammar of the rest of the parasha, which is very neatly organized in units, it should have written, should have said, Yom Rishon, all other days say, second day, third day, fourth day, that those are the names of the days in Hebrew, <laughs> their, their order in the week. <clears throat> and by the way, the Sephardic tradition is when you say Shir Shel Yom, you say Hayom Yom Echad Beshabbat and not Rishon Beshabbat. Um, so he says, Lama Katav Echad, why is it in Echad? Lefi Shaya Kadosh Baruchu, Yehid Be Olamo, Sheloni Vrua Malachim Ad Yom Sheni, Kach Mefurash Bivreshit Rabba. It says Yom Echad, day one, to tell you that God was one. God is the only one in the world because the angels were only created in the second day, and that's uh, a quote from. Genesis Rabbah, the Midrash on Bereshit. Now, the uh, the idea of the creation of the angels, right? Where is it in the where is it in the in, in Bereshit? They're not mentioned anywhere. I mean, the first angels that show up are <coughs> the angels that come to talk to uh, uh, to Lot. Abraham sees Anashim, and then Lot sees Malachim, and they are understood as messengers. In most of the Tanakh, the the, the word Malach. Uh, means a messenger um, and not uh, an entity that was created by God, but rather <clears throat> any natural phenomenon or something that does God's um, tasks. So that in itself is a, uh, is again, I think very, this is very clear that this is a dialogue with, with Christianity to say that God, we, we're talking about a complete unity of God. The, the Christians, by the way, the, uh, the church was obsessed with, with, with angels. There's a whole uh, field of science called angelology. I mean, not, not really science, but uh, how many angels you could, could live on a, on a pin's head and, and stuff like that. And uh, we were affected also. There's a lot of literature about angels from the time of the Midrash, late Midrash on, with names. Uh, in the early Midrash, you only find Gavriel, Michael, that's it. And then uh, they keep, you know, the list keeps growing. But there, here I think it's very, it's, it's pretty clear that what Rashi is trying to say, God is unique, God is alone. Um, and to add to that is the fact that sometimes the Malachim are called B'nei Ha'Elohim. Not, not everywhere in Tanakh. In the book of Job, for example, the, when the, the angels, we understand that they're angels, come back to report to God what they saw on earth, and he asks Satan, did you see Job? The, the Navi says, the author says, Elohim The the sons of God, this, uh, this, is a, this is a problematic term. So you understand B'nei Elohim, we understand it as Malachim, but Rashi says, because of that, Rashi says, Lo malachim ad yom sheni. It's a separate creation, it's a different entity, there, God alone is unique in his world. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we could, 
look at another comment here of uh, uh, 1.8. This is also based on a, on a Midrashic statement in Masechet Hagiga. Sa maim, or sham maim, esh umaim, she'ervan ze baze ve'asa mehem shamaim. So this is a, uh, a homily, really, uh, a, a wordplay on the word shamaim. It sounds like, on one hand, sham maim, water is there, or esh umaim. Now she says God mixed them, mingled them together, fire and water, and he made the heavens from them. So here, I think that what we see here is not an inf- not a um, a midrash, even though it's quote he cites Masechet Hagiga, so it is from the Talmud. But the rabbis of the Talmud themselves are uh, citing Greek science. The Greeks looked at the world as made from four elements: water, fire, wind, and soil or dust. So everything is made from these elements. So they look at heavens, at the, at, at the sky. Water comes from the sky. So the, the sky is made from uh, the element of fire. Each, each one of those four elements was assigned two characteristics of warmth and dryness. So fire is, uh, uh, fire is hot and dry. Water is hot and wet. Uh, dust is dry and cold. And soil is, sorry, soil is... Uh, dry and warm and the wind is dry and cold. So each one of them has two character traits. So, and we'll see other things that came, that crept from Greek science into Rashi and into the, uh, uh, through the Midrash. Um, What's the connection between the water and the fire? And how there's no connection. And this pasuk. There's no connection. This is, the, like I said, I, <laughs> that was my concern. The, that, um, the, the uh, there's no connection necessarily. Uh, that's why I said Rashi's Rashi's commentary is very interesting. His uh, there are places where where you see the the storyline going through, and in other places it just is he makes uh, a grammatical comment, a dikdu, uh, trying to explain the language or science or geography. So here I, I highlighted this one because it's uh, it's a play on words, but really it relies on the sort of scientific knowledge of the time. Uh, but not necessarily every comment fits into place in, in the, every commentary. Um, like the next one, 110. Uh, God named the uh, the water or the, or the, uh, the congregated water, he called seas. So the Talmud says, Vahalo yam ehadu, there's only one sea around the world, right? So they come from the point of view that the all oceans are connected. Hmm. Um, the, uh, again, this comes from a sort of limited view of geography, of you know, what, what they know around them. The, the flavor of a fish which comes up from the sea at Akko, Acre, in the north of Israel, is not the same as the flavor of fish which comes up at the sea at Espania, which is Spain. So this is just a sort of a cute commentary that is, again, from the Midrash, that uh, that reflects the other aspects of the Midrash that I mentioned last week, which is the rabbi is trying to uh, embellish the story to make it interesting, to make it intriguing. It's not, it's not a commentary on, on the Pasuk, really, necessarily, but rather maybe whoever... whoever uh, made this commentary could have been part from a greater drasha, from a greater sermon about the wonders of nature and about the diversity of life and, you know, the fish that you, you have here and in Spain and probably before the invasion of the Greeks, you didn't get, you know, uh, so many uh, opportunities to eat fish from Spain. But that, so that could be also, whoever commented on that said, you know, we're lucky to have this, uh, you know, don't complain about Hellenism. There are cer- certain things that are good, which in general is a is an important concept to have in mind. As much as the the Jews fought with the Greeks, they knew uh, how to appreciate the good things of the the Greeks. Even the rabbis, the rabbis were very fond of the Greek language and uh, its grammar and syntax. And so it's a it's 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 a very fine and logical uh, language. 
And a lot of rabbis, because of that, also had uh, Greek names. We have Rabbi Alexandri, uh, Ben Nanas, all other names. Someone once did the, the work of, you know, of finding all the uh, Greek influence names of the rabbis. So we're not Hellenizers, but real Tamid Hachamim. Um, so, okay, we go. Um, I'll go to Pasuk 114. Again, I'm highlighting Sturm Midrashim. Uh, the, the word let there be lights in the in the in the in the, in the heavens. The word is written without the vav after the aleph. It should be mem aleph vav reshtaf or two vavs. Yeah, but it's written mem aleph reshtaf me'erot. In the uh, why is it so? Because it is a cursed day when children are liable to suffer from croup, so one type of of, of uh, breathing uh, disease. Uh, in re- in, re- in reference to this, we read on the fourth day of the week they used to fast to avert avert croup from uh, the children. So this. As another example of what we could call pseudoscience in Rashi, there's a lot of pseudoscience in the in the in the Talmud as well, based on uh, you know observations. They, you know, one um, we don't <coughs> most people don't believe in this anymore, but you know a lot of people don't uh, allow their children, and of course they wouldn't do it to swim during the three weeks. Uh, not mm-hmm. only the like from the Chodesh <laughs> Av till Tisha B'Av. That was a, when I was growing up in Israel, even people were more lenient about the three weeks. They said, you don't go to the sea. It's dangerous. People drown. And why is that? Because the three weeks are under a, uh, an evil sign. And they explain exactly what are the forces of nature that control those days. And they believe that uh, bad things, you could call it, you know, it's between superstitions and, uh, and pseudoscience, so that, where the explanation is very simple. In the summer, more people are out, <laughs> more people go to the sea, more, you know, more accidents happen. Uh, but they were so concerned that they said even a, a schoolmaster is not allowed to whip the children as he usually does uh, during the three weeks because it's dangerous. Um, <clears throat> anyway, or I'm going to in the in the same pasuk. No, this is in still one fourteen. Can vayu leotot, vayu leotot. This is a little more down in the same commentary of Rashi. Vayu leotot. They shall be for signs in Rekia Shamaim. They shall be for signs. So uh, Rashi says, "Kshar meorot lokin siman ra'u la'olam sheneimar meotot Hashamaim al tehatu." When the heavenly luminaries are eclipsed, it is a sign of ill omen for the world. As it is written, be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. But you have to do that. That's what Yirmiyahu says. Be not dismayed by the signs of heaven. When you carry out the will of the Holy One, blessed be, you need uh, apprehend no calamity. Don't, don't worry, nothing will happen. So Yirashi again reflects a belief that was common in his time still. I think even today, people still believe that uh, a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse is, uh, is bad omen. No, still some people still believe that. Um, but less and less, hopefully. Um, but this is maybe among other cultures. Yeah, among other. Yeah, but I think even even in, in this in this country in this culture, some people still feel that it's a bit scary. Then we can't uh, deny that. Um, but that is something that we'll see later on in many, in other commentaries of Rashi, where there is a real struggle of the rabbis with. Uh, with astrology, which is interesting because on one hand, they say, they believe that on Wednesday, you know, kids will fall ill. Uh, but that is sort of like built into the system, that they accepted that. But with astrology, they try constantly to say, astrology doesn't work. But they don't say it doesn't work completely. They say, it works if you believe in it, but you as, a, as, an, as an Israelite or as a Jew, you can be above it. And there are uh, famous, uh, story, famous commentaries that made their, their way into the Midrash that are related to that. For example, the, uh, the alleged uh, attack of Nimrod on Abraham, so alleged because it's not in the text. Uh, Nimrod was the king of uh, uh, Akkad, 
I mean, in the in the ancient Near East, and he tries to kill Abraham. Why does he try to kill him? Because he saw uh, that Abraham's star rises and uh, over uh, eclipses his star, and then therefore he decides to kill him. But he doesn't know that <coughs> God is going to foil his uh, his plan. Same with with Moshe. He sees the uh, Pharaoh sees that Moshe is going to be punished by water, so he orders to throw all the babies into the water. He doesn't know that. Moshe will eventually be punished because he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock. So this is a common theme in all the commentaries of, of the rabbis, which Rashi also quotes, on astrology, where the rabbis do accept it. They don't say it's, it's not scientific, it's not proven. It is, it's valid. However, we are above it. As long as you believe in God, you are above it. So there's another... Uh, um, message that the uh, the rabbis and, and Rashi is following that, Suud is trying to deliver. Yes. Is that view changed among the rabbis? Are there any more contemporary rabbis in the last couple hundred years that still have some sort of belief in astrology? <sighs> I wish I could say yes. <laughs> um, there, there are still a lot of this um, still in our literature and uh, part of it is because of Kabbalah, because Kabbalah adopted the uh, the astronomy slash astrology uh, theory of the uh, of ancient times. So the the Kabbalah still speaks of seven planets, and the seven planets are the Sun, Jupiter, Mars. Uh, no, sorry, Saturn. Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, uh, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, no, and the Moon. They all revolve around the, uh, around Earth. So, uh, <laughs> but there are seven planets. The truth is that there's seven. Planets. Yeah, but they count the Sun as well and and the Moon, right? Um, so and not and not Earth. But no, the thing is that I think that for many, uh, there are still many rabbis out there who live in this kind of the cognitive dissonance where they say, this is what science says, and I, be- and I believe it. I mean, they're willing to believe it, but whatever the, the Zohar or Kabbalah or Midrash says is also valid under different circumstances, you know, from whatever point of view that they look at. And of course, you'll have a problem when you look at, at, at Maimonides, uh, who speak about the Galgalim there. They had the idea of sort of like uh, invisible wheels or... or uh, and I would think of the orbits, but they thought it was physical um, entities. They are out there, and Maimonides also speaks about the, uh, the spirit or the enemy of, of each planet that could do certain things, and he explains paganism as a uh, misunderstanding that people, in his view, there was a process of deterioration where uh, people started first worshiped God, then they said it is uh, disrespectful to talk directly to God, so let us talk to one of the planets who serve God, but they knew that the planets serve God and they have no power of their own, and then they start thinking that the planets have a power of their own. But Rambam does not reject the idea that the planets do have uh, certain powers or uh, character traits. I mean, we practice today prohibitions against fish and meat on the same plate, for example. Oh, that's... <laughs> that is there's already halakha that is based on this is the kind of pseudoscience I would say that is based on observation but not on uh, not on um, it's, it's not enforced. empirical science it's enforced it's enforced but I think what I'm saying is it's based on observation I mean like random observation not empirical science did they uh, did they have a control group that ate you know only fish and only meat and then a group that only ate fish and meat to see if they felt Ill, they didn't do that. What happens is someone, really, most probably, <coughs> someone choked on a bone fish that was mixed with, you know, with chicken or meat on, on the plate, and they said, this is dangerous, don't do that. And then it evolved into something that, you know, it's davar her, it could cause leprosy, etc. Um, what? Hey. Yes. <laughs> In any case, most, most recipes that I know don't call for fish and meat together anyway. Yeah, no. so <laughs> then it, then it t- takes life of, of its own with changing dishes and uh, and so even when I try to resist, and I have guests, and I say no, no, I, I want to keep that. 
you know, and make it, no, we'll take yours as well. So probably. And then, and then you have the whole issue of vaccinations today. I just, yeah. I just got today my MMR. Oh yeah, yeah. So Rabban Gamil has as the uh, in in his attic. He has maps of the of the moon and the earth and their positions. Oh, also mentioned Rosh Hashanah. It also says uh, the Talmud says about Rabban Gamil that he had a, a tube, like something like a telescope that he could, uh, you know, look for uh, uh, for afar. So. Um, the, some things in the in the Talmud and in our in our tradition are uh, are truths, some are scientific truths, and and most are not, because they relied on the knowledge that was available to them. But to, even you know, saying that is considered heresy among a lot of people. Um, you look up uh, Rabbi Nathan Slifkin. Is now he's the he has the the dubious title as the zoo rabbi. Yeah, he just started. He just tried to to write a book explaining to kids what. What are the animals in the Talmud? And then he realized those are not real animals. <laughs> and then the people said, "You're not a real rabbi." So uh, that, that's how it happened. Um, uh, but it, it, we'll see one of these animals in Rashi soon. It's here in Bereshit. Um, we have um, one sixteen, uh, and a midrash that is uh, quoted by many teachers. In our, you know, elementary school system, and sometimes even more into, uh, you know, middle school, Shavim Nivreu, Amerot Agdolim, the two great luminaries, Shavim Nivreu, Venit Maata Levana Al Shikitrega Vamra, Yev Charlie Shneim Elachim Shit Ma Shish Tamishu Beketer Had. So the two great luminaries, the, what what uh, here, you know, the 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 teacher's favorite question, what bothered Rashi, right? This is like what what Rashi, what bothered Rashi? That not necessarily Rashi was bothered. Sometimes he has a there's a, a grammatical problem in the Pasuk. Sometimes there's not. It just has a nice idea that he wants to present. Here we could say that the the um, the question was raised not by him, already by the Midrash. The question that the Midrash raised based on uh, observing the text was in uh, in one verse, the Torah calls the luminaries the two great luminaries, and then it refers to them as the great luminary and the and the smaller luminary, which is not a problem at all. They are greater than others, and among them there is difference. There should not be any any uh, reason for for a question. If there is a question, is you know from our point of view, is that. The, one of them is a true luminary, the sun, and the other is not. One of them is big, and the other is tiny, right? So, and and that is a proof that the Torah is not a another scientific uh, document, and that it talks to people at the level of their understanding, the way they perceive the world. And we still, we still, a lot of us think of it that way if we don't really uh, delve into the into the issue. So, but what Rashi says is that the the sun and the moon were created at, with the same size, and the moon was later on diminished because it complained. And it said, you can't have two kings wearing one crown, right? No uh, uh, rotation of, uh, no, was it, was a, uh, the Roman Empire went with two emperors for a while, right, before the triumvirate? I think they had that, uh, two emperors. So it says that, that's impossible. You can't have two kings using the same crown. Um, so that is just, uh, and, and therefore God made the moon smaller. Then therefore the God made, made the moon smaller, but in order to appease the moon, because it felt hurt, God gave the, the moon, all the stars, all the tiny little stars that are much bigger than the whole solar system. Like, you know, Betelgeuse, if you put Betelgeuse on the sun, I think it reaches all the way to, to Jupiter or something like that. Uh, so this is one of those tiny stars out there. Um, <clears throat> what what was the purpose of this midrash? I don't know. I think it's it, it's it was meant to to get people uh, again interested, intrigued. It's a nice story. It's a it's a story that this is uh, animation. You take inanimate objects, the sun and the moon, and you turn them into personalities. And this is really a story that kept fascinating commentators for generations into Kabbalah, into uh, um, even Halakha, to say, what is this story here? We'll learn Musa from that. You have to be, you have to, to, to accept what you have. 
Um, and there are many other stories that follow the same line, that if you want more than what you have, you'll lose even what you already got. Um, but to me, the really amazing thing that happened with this Midrash is that our, so there are some serious, uh, or otherwise serious people, who use it to explain the discrepancy between the age of the world as it appears to be in the Torah, and the age of the world as we know it to be. It's around, uh, f- right now, 14 and a half billion or 15 billion years, give, give or take a couple of years, because I checked last time, maybe two years ago. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so I heard some people that otherwise I thought were serious thinkers say, yes, it's not the same, but according to the Torah, there were two sons, at the, right? They were the same size at the, at the early days of creation for three days, and the amount of energy that was produced could have uh, distorted the time-space continuum. Seriously, it's not in the Torah. It's not there. The Torah is clearly not a scientific book. The midrash that was floated, you know, someone invented it to to explain a little grammatical problem. It's really not a problem, but still, you know, we 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 use it in in such a manner. It's important um, to, to to keep that in mind. Um, okay, the, uh, the the next pasuk. The way I mean, you can ask questions on that. It's um, I'm, I'm going from pasuk to pasuk. It's uh, they're not all related, but it's not cursory because we're, I'm highlighting the pasukim that have importance in that context. Yes. I mean, this is a question you don't know the answer to, but what does Rashi think he's doing? Like in this instance. I mean, does he think he's saying what is, and he's actually explaining what happened? Is that his conception of what happened? Um, that's a good question. So, I last last time when we we, we spoke about the introduction, like what what was Rashi's purpose? Um, I think it's not uh, it's not only one thing. He he wants to write a commentary for sure. That's one thing that he wants to do. In this commentary. He's going to solve some grammatical problems, geographical, technical problems, etc. He's also uh, going to uh, present some of his favorite material from the Midrash. And also, uh, he wants to teach people uh, to give them tools to deal with their reality, which is the 12th, you know, uh, not 12th, 11th century uh, northern France and Germany facing the Crusades, facing uh, animosity from, uh, um, from Christianity. And um, so he wants to give them tools to, to deal, to answer back and to uplift their spirit. So all these things are there. And he knows he didn't do a complete uh, job. And he told Rashbam, this is the book that I have here, uh, that if he had time, he would write new commentaries every day. But he, wrote, he, he, was, he was a busy man. He finished writing the commentary. He couldn't go back and, and fix it. So he left it at that. And, and after it was written, people came to the conclusion that it was all sacred, that Rashi wanted each and every word to be there the way he wanted it. So fine. Um, so in verse 121, read another, uh, another commentary that is... You know, half zoology, half mythology, and another half agada. So three halves. The gim gedolim shebayam that the taninim, the the huge creatures, the crocodiles, whatever. Uh, Rashi says, large the large fishes that are in the sea, of divrei agada, who ligatanu ben zugo, shebraam zacharu nekeva, ve'aragat nekeva umlachal atzadikim laatid lavo. According to the Midrash, those big fishes are the, the, the whale and its spouse, who were created male and female, but God killed the female and uh, made from it uh, you know, salted meat, or with a whale jerky, I guess that would be. No, this is a, um, it's called chla, uh, no, in, in Arabic. Latzadikim laatid lavo. And that's for the righteous. Because if they keep multiplying, the world would not be able to withstand them. That's a very strange midrash. It's a very, very strange midrash for the simple fact that God is not portrayed here as a very good planner. Like, I created a creature that I cannot control. 
So what am I going to do? I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill them. There's no. That's it. There's no species. There's only one. <laughs> there's only one uh, specimen of that species that we're going to live forever. And where where do we get this animal from that could live forever? This whole thing is strange. So Leviathan appears in other places in uh, in in Tanakh, mainly in Job, and is the, the Leviathan is praised there, and it is an animal that really fascinated the readers of Tanakh. And it, the word made its way to English, right? Leviathan. Um, and the behemoth is its partner. There's another mythical animal that lives on, on land, also created male and female, and only the male survived. So, um, you know, if people come to it from a, from a gender point of view, they would say, oh, this is a, this is a myth about the uh, the... The ancient, the ancient goddess, right, or the, uh, um, as Eric Newman called it, the great mother, the, according to some theories, the original societies were matriarchal. And then later on, patriarchal societies took their place. And then you have, um, they have this fear, this mythical fear from the woman who is able to create life. So they kill the woman in a way. So if they're not, if she's not killed, she's being subdued by, uh, by men. Some people might understand it that way. Uh, I don't think it's here. I mean, it's not. It's not in the pasuk, but it is in the second chapter of Bereshit. That's not, not from Rashi's point of view. My comment, my interpretation of the second chapter of Bereshit, where we see the struggle between the man, the woman, and the serpent, has to do with that power that men attribute to women, the power to give life, which is. Uh, it's ambiguous because on one hand, the woman is a giver of life, but she also the creator of death because the moment life starts, death starts. So there's another co- complex issue there. But why does Rashi bring it here? That is, a, that is, I think, part of the embellishment of the story. It makes it much more interesting. It does tie into ancient myths that of the, the great sea monsters, and actually, there are still right uh, myths like that. This is the one place that we don't control. <laughs> we don't control the, the abyss. I think people didn't find Lochi yet, right? Loch, the people are Loch still Ness. Loch, Loch, the, the Loch Ness monster, uh, or the giant squid, or whatever. There's still, you know, uh, the uh, the monster of the abyss. But that definitely uh, echoes the ancient uh, Babylonian myth. So there's a lot here in this Rashi. But to answer Bruce's question for what was Rashi thinking? When he brought that specific pasuk, this is just an ornament. This is really an ornament. When you uh, when you're about to talk about the parasha and you want to get something people to be interested, that's a nice story. This is something that people will talk about, uh, and will even later on mention in uh, in Berkat Amazon uh, on Sukkot. According to some tradition, you say, right. "May Hashem." Uh, give us the merit to sit in the uh, sukkah or Rosh Yatan, because then God will kill the other one, the male as well, and we'll, we'll make a sukkah from its uh, skin. Yes. Um, I Yatan actually... Yatan is what God plays with. Yes, that's in Barchin of right? In chapter Kufdalet, uh, in, in 104, Yatan is the Yatan right? It's mentioned in other places. Um, <laughs> no, but that is part in 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 Te'ilim, It's part of the description of the of the uh, the beauty of nature, but also the the greatness of the Creator. The uh, the author says, "I am Rahav Gadol Rahav Yadaim, Sham Remes Vele Mispar Hayot Katanot Im Gedolot." Look at the ocean; it's vast, it's immense. You have small creatures, great creatures. Sham Onyoti Halechun, ships travel there. And, and the whale is your toy thing, God's toy thing. Um, which I imagine, I, you can imagine people who went for the first time on a ship and saw a whale jumping out. It still is amazing. I saw it on, on uh, you know, with David Edinburgh uh, <laughs> narrating, and it's fascinating. So definitely if you see it live. Um, but I remember one, one time I was... Uh, I was visiting my aunt just before Sukkot, and she's the kind of a person who's very meticulous. She has to get everything ready before any holiday, everything, uh, you know. So before Sukkot, is the Sukkah is built. Yes, you have the four. Yes, everything is ready. She's very excited. I said, did you get, um, did you get uh, canned whale? And she says, what? 
I said, yeah, you know, Sukkot, we say we're, we're going to sit in the Sukkot Leviathan. And she got so nervous. She says, no, I didn't know. What... I said, no, I'm kidding. It's not kosher. I felt bad. I said, it's not kosher. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes. Is this, the, is this the first time we hear the idea of maleness and femaleness from Rashi? In Rashi, yes. In Rashi, yes. And, and that issue of male-female, the dichotomy and also sexuality, um, this is not a, this is, there's no sexual uh, innuendo here, but that is something that is uh, surprising <coughs> in Rashi, especially on Bereshit. When you look at, at, the, at the verses, what Rashi puts it in, even though it's not there, you, you have to ask the question, why? So I did it why I called all the, uh, all the places in, in Rashi on Bereshit where this is brought in, and it, because when you see them, you know, once in a while, as you read, like every, every other chapter, something pops up, okay. It, it is a blip on the radar, radar and you see the next parasha next week. So, but I put them all together and it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite a handful of sources. For example, when, uh, it, when we read about the flood and it says, kol basaret al-aretz, et darko al-aretz, the old flesh, has uh, distorted its paths on earth, right? It's obviously talking about human beings and not about animals. Um, but Rashi says animals were uh, crossbreeding. Min b'sheno mino. Well, where did you get this from, right? And then the kids are being taught that in school, even in Berman. They they're come back and they say, what did you learn today? We learned that before the flood, the stork married an elephant. <laughs> <That's> like <laughs> they don't know how to tell them that, right? Um, but then there um, there are other things uh, when Sarai it says Vatikah Sarai Tagar Shifchata, but it turns on Abraham. Sarai takes Hagar and she gives it to Abraham on its face. When you read the pshat, it's just a it's a transaction which it was actually uh, bound by a contract. This was a, a contract of a surrogate mother. Hagar was, was to be a surrogate mother. And that's why the Torah says she was taken and given. Rashi adds, bidvarim. She spoke softly to her. She took her with words. What are the words? Look, you have such a great merit that you're going to cling to such a holy body, the body of Avraham. Again, this is strange. Um, so the, the, there could be different explanations to each and every one of these instances. But I think there's also a greater uh, cause that you know uh, puts them all together, and that is not to make it uh, you know no you know uh, light, but it's sort of entertainment for the people who who heard the stories. That was their light entertainment, you know, something that is intriguing. This is. Uh, this is something that we have in the literature, you know, medieval literature. You think about Canterbury Tales or uh, a genre that was called uh, the modesty literature that was common among Christians and Muslims and Jews. Rabbi Nunesim of Kairouan uh, wrote something like that and there are uh, priests and monks who wrote. And those modesty tales were very saucy. They were very, uh, uh, they, they would not pass, you know, any, any school censorship committee would not accept them. I don't know how they accept uh, Canterbury Tales, right? But it was like sort of bringing those things through the back door. I'm telling you what you're not supposed to do, and then uh, then they're doing it. So um, that is something that we have there. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip ahead to uh, no, no, 26. Um, to 126, and here is a is a really problematic pasuk in the in the original text. Uh, maybe one of the most problematic uh, pasukim in the Torah, and that is when God turn God turns to someone right and says, "Let us make men naase adam betzalmenu kidmuten." Let us make men in our likeness, in our image. Um, Rashi says, <coughs> This teaches us the, the meekness or the humility of God. So, uh, because man is 
in the likeness of the angels, and they might envy him. Therefore, he took counsel with them. So it's not really meekness or, or humility. It's a sort of, but also consideration. God is considerate. He doesn't want the angels to get upset, so he consults them. So first, I'll try sort of to offer a commentary on the, on the text itself. Why is it in the plural? So the, the text in the, in the Hebrew, speaking about the creation of men, moves from the plural to the singular and then back from the singular to the plural. So God says, let us make men. And then he says, God made men in the singular. And, it, and then when he speaks about men, men was created. God created them. So the Torah starts talking about God in a form of duality and then move to the singular. Start talking about men in the singular and then moves to duality. So I think that this is a sort of a subliminal message the Torah sends of the way we perceive God and humans. Humans are by nature dichotomous. We have we are multifaceted, we are we're we have duality built into us. We can never understand God's uniqueness. But God so created mankind as a uh, as a sort of united united species, men and women together, and then they split and they are diverse. And we perceive God as multiple or dual, but actually God is one. Um, maybe that's the interpretation of Pasuk, but Rashi speaks about God's humility. He, he is considered t- towards the angels. And there's another layer. So first of all, Rashi teaches us Musa, and that is an, uh, that is an element that uh, keeps surfacing in Rashi. He says, Kan limda Torah this is the way of the Torah to teach us um, uh, civility and good manners. This is how you talk. So you look what, this is what God does. This is what you should do. Um, but the other thing is, that is, it's very subtle that we could almost miss it. The Torah says clearly, God is speaking. There's nobody else there. And, and God says, let us make men in our image. It's like maybe the royal we. And the Torah says, and God created men in his image. Right? The image of God. But Rashi says, is in the image of the angels. That, um, I mean, it is taken from the Midrash, but maybe Rashi chose this Pasuk because it, um, it has to do with a certain... Um, theology that existed among Rashi's circle, people before him, and I mean his masters, and then his followers, and uh, a circle known as the early Hasidim Ashkenaz, early uh, Hasidim or pious men of Ashkenaz, that um, they tried to deal with the idea of anthropomorphism in the Torah. How do we understand words like God's hand, God's heart, God's eye, etc., etc.? Um, or all the other anthropomorphic uh, statements in the Torah about emotions and etc. So they said that there is their solution was there's sort of an intermediary between God and humans called Hakavod Nivra or Hakavod Nira, God's glory, God's Kavod, uh, which also appears in Unkelus in the Aramaic translation, the Karad Adonai, the the glory of God, and the glory is sort of one one of the angels. So God has no physical form, but the glory that God created, which is the intermediary between us and him, does have a, uh, a human shape and dimensions. There's a book about it called Shi'or Koma, the size of the body. Um, some mythic, sort of mystical, mythical uh, story. So maybe this is what Rashi is hinting here. That's why he connects to this Perush, that uh, how do you explain God creates man in the image of angels. Now, on one hand, like he's dealing with a theological question, but at the same time, just like the first, first, very first commentary that I mentioned, verse 1 1, where he says, Why did the Torah start from Bereshit? It should have started at chapter 12 in, uh, in Shemot. It probably not intentionally but undermines one of the most important principles of the Torah, most of 
the most revolutionary idea maybe of the Torah, the idea of the image of God. Because the idea of the image of God is the, not only that gives us greatness and, and allows us to aspire to achieve wonderful things, it also, um, it also re- completely rejects idolatry. Because the idea of idolatry is that God has a certain image and your idea of God is not my idea of God. But also uh, the basis for our equal treatment to all mankind. Because the first to be created in the image of God are zachar unekeva, male and female. And that is the, the physical difference between male and female is the first that is uh, the first visible sign when the society that everybody comes from the same ethnicity, right? The first thing that you, you could tell people apart is male and female. And if the Torah says both were created in the image of God, that means that the physical image is not the image of God. Rather, it is something that is spiritual, our ability to communicate, to be creative, etc. So when Rashi says, Adam u'bidmut ha-malachim, in a way, this Midrashic statement is the exact opposite of the message of the Torah. And Kabbalah actually, I think, has, has, the, has a great answer to this question. Of what? Of, of uh, let us make man in our image. Oh, yes. The, the, the dichotomy, uh, uh, and, and that is, at least according to Ramban, uh, that uh, tohu is actually what God creates in the beginning, and that all the creations are done by tohu, which is the physical, God creates the spark, if you right. will, and that... Homer Hayuli, called like the uh, the amorphous, uh, but but that so right and and then but but man is the only creation because all the time it says let there be let right. there be but this is God is actually participating with Tohu mm-hmm. so that's right is to to make you know a human being so that we have this spiritual aspect that other creations of God don't have yeah but that also by the way when we can go with that. This is the problem that people had with with Kabbalistic interpretation because they they were afraid that some of them uh, tilt towards paganism uh, when you talk about the Sefirot and uh, you know in Kabbalah that the the idea of that I mentioned before of the Kavod Anira, which is the intermediary between us and God Kabbalah was interpreted into the idea of the Sefirat and Sof the the highest sphere which is infinity that is uh, unattainable. And then the Zketer, or the the like the next Sefirah over is the one that communicates with the, with, with that Sefirah. So sort of a separation. It's a problematic concept. But uh, yes, the uh, Kabbalah tried to offer a different answer to that. Um, so uh, with that pasuk, we conclude. The uh, Rashi says in the second part of that, Lo nimna katuv milelamed derech eres umidat anava. Even though the angels did not really help God, so why does he consult them? The Torah still wanted to teach us good manners, that you always listen to your uh, inferiors, to people who are younger than you, even though you're not going to uh, to follow, you already made the decision, just to make them feel good. So that's what I said, like this one, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, flavor that Rashi adds to the Pasuk, and he makes it accessible uh, to us. Even if we disagree, with the specific commentary, but this is the air uh, of, of the, the, and the feeling that he's trying to give us. So let's uh, conclude here. Uh, we are at the next pasuk we're going to go to will be 127. I'm, I'm giving, you know, people who are listening will li- be listening later, uh, show a homework, show a bite, and that is Rashi uh, contradicts the two psukim in the first chapter. It says that they were created male and female together. And in the second chapter, it says that the man was created first, then the animals, then the woman from the rib. So how does this work? He'll answer that. Okay, we'll stop here. He'll answer it here. What? He'll answer it here. He'll answer it here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it will be a problem because... Uh, if I said that the, the other thing that that doesn't uh, present God as a as a very good planner, this is even worse. Because the answer is that He created them as a, one entity connected in.